I'd like to welcome to your screens, David Burton and Amanda Weaver, who will discuss the changing landscape of employment law. As you might imagine, it's been a busy 18 months for David and Amanda as they've helped their clients navigate the impact of COVID on their businesses, while also staying up to speed on the numerous evolving changes to our employment laws, which is the topic of today's discussion. David and Amanda both advise clients on employment compliance matters arising out of various state and federal employment laws. They also counsel employers as litigation and employment matters arise. David and Amanda, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Jen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Our agenda is we're gonna cover various topics and we're gonna move fairly fast, but we're gonna give you a workplace discrimination law update, a wage and hour law update, worker misclassification updates, non-compete and whistleblower protections, medical marijuana legalization updates. That's a, a big issue in many states. And then the ever present COVID-19 and some updates there. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. All right, let's start on the employment discrimination front. Uh, Virginia, which used to be one of the most uh, employer friendly states, uh, went through a uh, quite a revolution in the General Assembly in 2020 and adopted amendments to what had been a very minor statute in Virginia uh, passed called the Virginia Human Rights Act. Uh, the Virginia Human Rights Act was an anti-discrimination statute that only applied to small employers, those employers that had between five and 14 employees. Uh, it was meant to cover the gap where Title VII, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act sat but what we did in Virginia in 2020 is the General Assembly adopted the Virginia Values Act. And it is much more expansive than what we had under the Virginia Human Rights Act. You can think about this as, again, Title VII for Virginia, as well as the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the Disabilities Act, Americans with Disabilities Act. But what that statute did in its amendment is it continued a prohibition on discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, and marital status, but it added sexual orientation, gender identity, and veteran status. Uh, there's a distinction in the statute between termination claims and non-termination claims, and that is important for purposes of the jurisdiction and, and who it will apply to. If there are termination claims brought under the Virginia Values Act, it will apply to any employer that has more than five employees. So again, that covers most employees or most employers out there. Uh, for non-termination claims, the employer under the Virginia Values Act has to have 15 or more employees. So if there's a sexual harassment claim that doesn't involve uh, a termination, then you would need 15 or more employees for the Virginia Values Act to apply to you. But if it was a sexual harassment that resulted in a termination, then as long as you had five employees or more, that Virginia Values Act could apply to you. One of the most, one of the things that's really important about this statute is that it created new damages for employers. The Virginia Human Rights Act in the past was cap basically at just back pay for a limited period of time. Now, there are no caps on damages, compensatory or punitives. That seems very interesting because there is a statute in Virginia that caps punitive damages, but it appears that the Virginia Values Act has exempted that statute. So you may get in punitive damages, compensatory damages, attorney's fees, and costs. Uh, why this statute is seemingly going to be very, very important for employees and for plaintiff's lawyers is that it allows these claims to be brought in state court of, in, in Virginia. And Virginia does not have an effective uh, summary judgment mechanism in state court. So presumably there are going to be a lot of these claims filed by plaintiffs in uh, state court where it will be harder to have the cases 
kicked out on summary judgment, and there will be significantly enhanced damages perhaps for employees. Next slide, please. All right, well, let's, let's talk about that as we've talked about the jury issue. Uh, this is gonna be an audience participation, so you can feel free to add, add your answers to the chat function, but do you think the fact that there can now be jury trials in Virginia state court for discrimination claims will cause there to be more cases filed in state court under the Virginia Values Act, or will plaintiffs still pursue discrimination claims in federal court? Answer A would be yes, more cases will be filed in state court, and answer B is no, plaintiffs will still be bringing their discrimination claims in federal court. We got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of answers here. All right. What I would tell you is it's a bit of a trick question. Uh, the, the jury is, the, as we speak about a jury, the jury is still out. Uh, there so far have not been a significant number of these cases filed in state court. Uh, the state was a little slow in getting the Office of Attorney General's division set up to investigate the claims, but eventually one will presume that we will see many more of these claims in state court rather than in federal court. Uh, next slide, please. All right, Virginia also passed the Virginia Pregnancy Discrimination Statute. And it again is gonna to apply to employers that have five or more employees. And the big emphasis on this statute is kind of notification rights to employees and reasonable accommodation requirements of an employer. So if you are five or more employers, employees in Virginia, you have to make reasonable accommodations for any known limitations to your employees if they relate to their pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition. Uh, that obligation will also uh, require you to accommodate for lactation in the workplace. Uh, many of you have already been subject to that because of some amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act a few years ago. Uh, you remember the, the, the rooms designated for women to use for that purpose, but this Virginia statute is adopting that also. Um, there is exceptions to reasonable accommodations, but you have to show that it would be an undue burden. Uh, and that's gonna be very, very difficult uh, to prove. Uh, you can't retaliate against employees for seeking an accommodation. And, th and then as we move towards the notification rights under this statute, employers will have to post information about employees' rights under the statute. You'll have to put that information up in the workplace. You have to include it in your handbook and you have to provide it to your employees directly at the time of hire. Finally, once an employee notifies you that they are pregnant, uh, you have to, within 20 days, again, provide the information about their rights under this statute. Uh, and any employee who feels they've been discriminated against under this statute or not reasonably accommodated has two years to bring a claim, and they are, again, entitled to compensatory damages back pay, attorney's fees, costs. So if someone didn't, if it's just an issue of not being provided a reasonable accommodation, they didn't lose any pay, they're not, in, they won't be entitled to back pay, but they could certainly get compensatory damages. Next slide, please. Uh, in the United States, of course, uh, overall, we all are aware of the Bostick versus Clayton County United States Supreme Court decision uh, last summer, uh, summer a year ago, but that stat, that case, came down and said that under Title VII, uh, the LBGTQ workers are protected. Sex applies to them. And in, as a result of that case, you've had many localities, even if the state has, even if respective states have not adopted these protections also, you have many localities that are taking steps to in and their ordinances include these types of protections. And there's a great example about Charlotte, North Carolina, their city council has done that themselves. 
Next slide, please. All right, let's do a wage and hour update. Next slide. All right, again, uh, Virginia, we're gonna talk about both Virginia, kind of state trends and the federal trends. But in Virginia, the minimum wage did increase to $9.50 per hour as of May 1st, 2021. It will then increase again on January 1st, 2022 to $11. And thereafter, there will be an annual increase in the Virginia minimum wage, and it will cap out on January 1st, 2026 at $15 an hour. If you have employees in Virginia who are not, who are not salaried employees, salaried exempt employees, you need to make sure you are complying with these increases. Next slide, please. Uh, Virginia also passed a wage theft law that is to a certain extent somewhat controversial right now because there's still a whole lot of question about provisions of the statute. Just yesterday or Wednesday, uh, there were criminal indictments handed down against some employers for quote wage threat, wage theft. But this statute in Virginia creates a private right of action for employees to sue for unpaid wages or other violations of the statute. Uh, it, there's a three-year statute of limitations, so it's different than under the federal law of two and two year for non-willful violations and three years for willful violations in Virginia. It will be a three-year statute of limitations. It also allows in, for state court collective and class actions. Uh, we haven't seen that in Virginia before, so that will be interesting, and we haven't yet seen it really in many cases be filed yet. Uh, employees will not have to go to the Department of Labor and Industry to seek redress. They can just pursue their own claim. Uh, it opens up the courthouse doors to back wages. And unlike the Fair Labor Standards Act, where you can get liquidated damages of times two of the unpaid wages, this statute allows for treble damages as well as costs and attorney's fees. Next slide, please. Uh, the Virginia Overtime Wage Act also applies to non-exempt hourly employees. Uh, you're going to have to pay 1.5 times the regular rate of employment. That's not that foreign to people. But where this statute is very different from the Fair Labor Standards Act is many employers are used to using for salaried non-exempt employees. They're used to using the fluctuating workweek method of overtime compensation, which is the concept that if you are paid on that salary basis, even though you are not exempt, uh, that salary is designed to compensate you for every hour you work in a week. So when it comes time to pay overtime, if you work over 40, you divide the number of hours by the hourly, the salary rate, when you divide it down to an hour to, an hour to get a rate, and then you just have to pay that at half time. This statute will not permit that. Uh, you will have to pay employees based upon 1.5 uh, times what the regular rate of employment would be, which would be to take that salary and divide it by 40 and then create a time and a half rate. Uh, again, three year statute of limitations for aggrieved employees. Next slide, please. Uh, in the US trend, the federal minimum wage has you know, it's not really increased since 2019, but most in 30 states and the District of Columbia, there have been increases and we we perceive that you will continue to see those changes across the country. And presumably uh, in the current administration, we will end up seeing some hikes on the minimum wage. Next slide, please. All right, another True or false quiz, put your answers in the chat box. Uh, true or false, given the trends in various states when it comes to wage and hour issues, will there be more litigation over overtime exemptions and other pay issues? True or false? Let's give it a couple more seconds. They're rolling in here very quickly. Uh, yes, we're seeing many more of these claims across the country being filed in state courts as opposed to federal courts. 
Uh, and that's because, again, higher minimum wage uh, requirements in certain states. And also, as we spoke about in Virginia, uh, there is a preference to be in state court for many employees because of the ability to avoid summary judgment. All right, well, I'm gonna turn uh, the presentation now over to Amanda Weaver, and she's gonna start off by giving you uh, an update on non-compete and whistleblower protections. Thanks, David. Um, and non-competes and whistleblower protections are just another area where Virginia has been very busy in the past year or so, uh, right along with uh, general trends nationwide. Um, next slide, please. So we're gonna start off with an audience participation, sort of the, 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 the pre-test here, uh, where, where everybody's heads are at, true or false, employee non-compete agreements are now banned in Virginia. And please remember to answer in the chat function. Lots of participation again, thanks everyone. And the answer to that one, I know we're still kind of finishing up, but the answer to that one is false. Um, there's been a lot of chatter about non-competes. I think many employees think non-competes are banned, um, but we aren't quite there yet. However, um, back in July, 2020, when the slew of new employment type uh, statutes became effective in Virginia, um, a new non-compete law took effect that does significantly limit the ways that employers uh, can use non-competes with their employees in Virginia. So ever since July, 2020, employers can no longer enter into or enforce or threaten to enforce non-compete agreements with any quote unquote low wage employee. This applies to contracts that were entered into after July 1st, 2020, um, though like many things in this law, there, it's not entirely clear. Most agree that this law does not appear to, um, it's not retroactive. So for, it, for agreements that were entered with employees prior, prior to July 1st of 2020, um, employers you know, are not in, in obvious direct violation of this law for having those agreements. However, anything that's been entered into since then is subject to this new statute. Um, the big difference in uh, the law now that this has been enacted is uh, this concept of a low wage employee. A low wage employee is um, any individual that's making less than the average weekly wage in Virginia. Uh, this is based on data that is compiled and published by the, by the state on a quarterly basis. It's currently around $63,000 a year. It, it fluctuates. It's a moving target. Um, only one, again, one of the only one of the aspects of this law that uh, are ambiguous or somewhat difficult for employers to keep up with. Um, some good news is even if you have an individual who may be making less than that target, uh, this law does not, it does not apply to employees who are paid predominantly by commissions. However, it does include pretty much anybody else, including trainees, interns, students, um, also doesn't define what predominantly means. So, you know, you're kind of left to your own devices to determine whether you feel someone is um, paid, their pay is, is made up an, by commissions enough that you would feel comfortable um, potentially risking exposure under the statute. Another interesting and perhaps not very well thought out aspect of this statute is that in addition to banning true non-competes, meaning um, a provision of an agreement that tells an employee they can't be employed with a competitor full stop, uh, there are also limitations for low wage employees when it comes to customer non-solicits. So you can't, it used to be you could, um, you know, for, uh, assuming it was well drafted, you could have a, res a restriction in an agreement that um, prohibited an employee from soliciting or doing competitive business with a customer for a period of time after their employment ended. And courts have historically been a little bit more, um, a, a little bit less suspect of those types of provisions because they're directly related to client relationships. Well, uh, now employers under this statute, if you're dealing with a low wage employee, you are prohibited from having a restriction that would compete, that would prohibit doing 
business with a customer if the employee did not quote unquote initiate contact with the customer. So um, that means that presumably if an employee goes out and, and begins doing competitive work with a customer after their employment ends, as long as they can show that they did not initiate contact, they are free to do that and you can't have an, an agreement that says otherwise. Uh, just as with the Human Rights Act, um, the, or the Virginia Values Act and the pregnancy discrimination law that David talked about, there are posting violations that carry some pretty hefty penalties. Um, there's a private right of action for employees, and then there are statutory penalties up to $10,000 per violation. Um, and this is where it used to be you could, you know, you could have a non-compete that was overbroad and some employers liked to have it for deterrent value, even if they knew they probably couldn't enforce it. Well, now, if you have a non-compete agreement after July 1st, 2020, that doesn't comply with the statute, then simply having that agreement or threatening to enforce it would be a violation in and of itself. Next slide, please. So in addition to the non-compete law, we also have a new Virginia whistleblower protection law. Again, another very sweeping uh, statute uh, creating new protections for employees under Virginia law. This statute would uh, protect any employee's good faith report of a violation of state or federal law to their supervisor, to the government, um, or to law enforcement, as well as participation in investigations, uh, refusal to engage in criminal acts, refusal to follow employers' uh, directions if they believe that they're unlawful, and of course, testifying or providing any information uh, related to a violation. What's so broad sweeping about this law, um, though it has a somewhat limited statute of limitations, it, it purports to, uh, again, like the, like the Virginia Values Act, it, it sort of almost uh, covers all of the same things that would otherwise have been covered by the federal retaliation laws, I mean, the retaliation claims that an employee can bring under Title VII or the ADA or, uh, or the ADEA, but allows potentially an avenue to do so in state court. Um, and for all the reasons that David pointed out earlier, that's very attractive, at least at this point for, um, for employees and for employee side attorneys because of the uh, significant, significant leverage that employers lose in state court where there are not strong summary judgment mechanisms. So it becomes much more difficult to get rid of those sorts of cases in state court short of a jury trial, which of course most employers are not uh, particularly excited to, to go through. And of course, like all of these new Virginia statutes, there are um, requirements for posting and, and written policies outlining employees' protections under the law. Next slide, please. So these up, I mean, these are, are changes that are certainly in line with national trends, um, including our neighbor to the north uh, in DC, they enacted probably the most sweeping non-compete restriction that anybody has ever seen to date. Um, it was enacted in January of this year. It hasn't taken effect and kind of keeps getting, the, 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 the date that it's expected to take effect keeps getting pushed back. But as drafted, it would ban nearly all post-employment non-competes. Um, and also even more, um, even more troubling for many employers is the fact that it uh, prevents competitive employment even during employment. So that the aspect of the law not only covers um, what you can restrict your employees from doing after they leave, but also prohibits uh, moonlighting policies, um, regardless of whether employment is, is competitive, it, it, it restricts an employer's ability to um, to prohibit their employees from going out and get a, getting other jobs while they're still employed. Um, that has obviously been an issue that employers in and around the DC area have been raising since this law was announced. Um, there was a proposed amendment that would, uh, that would try to clean that up a little bit, um, but at least as of now, it's not in effect. And I think it's been pushed back to 2022 when it would be expected to take effect. Um, Maryland's got a non-compete law that prohibits uh, uh, non-competes with lower wage workers. 
and as do many other states, Maine, New Hampshire, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Washington all recently enacted similar laws. Next slide, please. And then of course we have the recent um, executive order uh, under the Biden administration that um, it basically directed federal departments and agencies to take action to try to curb employer use of employee non-competes and encourage the Federal Trade Commission to ban or limit non-compete agreements as well um, with the policy of uh, reducing companies' abilities to uh, limit competition through the use of these employee agreements. This executive order did not in and, itself, in and of itself change the law. Um, it's not entirely clear how uh, the EO will be enforced to implement changes in the law, but it, the, the EO certainly indicated where um, these agencies were directed to act. Next slide, please. And that brings us to our next topic, which is worker misclassification updates, everybody's favorite. Again, we'll start with an uh, audience participation question. Remember to put your answers in the chat function. Um, question is, which of the following is not a factor when determining whether a worker has been misclassified as an independent contractor? A, whether the worker has agreed in writing to be classified as an independent contractor. B, whether the worker is subject to day-to-day -day supervision. C, whether the worker performs their work on the company's premises or using company resources. D, whether the worker is performing work outside the regular business of the company. And actually the answer, the answer to that one is A, uh, whether an employee has, or whether a worker has agreed in writing to be classified as an independent contractor is, is actually not determinative of whether an individual is truly an independent contractor. Uh, though you certainly don't want to have an employment agreement with an independent contractor, um, simply having an independent contractor agreement is not going to render that relationship an independent contractor relationship unless um, all of the factors that weigh towards an independent contractor relationship are met in practice. Next slide, please. So the reason that this has uh, come up in Virginia in particular is, again, we've recently um, enacted a statute uh, providing additional protections and um, sort of statutory remedies for worker misclassification in Virginia. Um, the, the threshold issue being, and this is not new, there have been an increased enforcement in this area, both within the state of Virginia, other states, and on a federal level for, for many years now. But the issue being employees who individuals that should be classified as employees based on the work that they're performing, being misclassified as independent contractors, and uh, the implications that that has where taxes aren't being withheld, workers' comp isn't being maintained, unemployment benefits aren't being provided, all of these things that uh, hurt the worker, but also hurt the government in terms of tax income. Um, so this new law in Virginia provides a private right of action for employees to sue for damages arising out of misclassification. That's new. Um, we have certainly always been aware of and, and cognizant of the risks of the Department of Labor learning about misclassification um, but, and under federal law, but under Virginia law, I mean, that was not really a, a, a state recourse for that. Now there is. Um, you can recover wages, salary. Ben value of benefits and expenses incurred because of the fact that the employee was misclassified. Um, that's huge. Uh, that is really broad sweeping. Uh, typically under the FLSA, under federal law, if you've found a misqualified, a, misclassified a worker, you're looking at back wages, you're looking at unpaid taxes and those sorts of, of damages. Um, but value of benefits could extend so far as if I didn't have um, if I didn't have health care coverage because I was misclassified and I had some sort of catastrophic illness, you know, that would fall under the damages contemplated by the Virginia statute. Um, the statute also codifies a um, presumption that individuals are employees and a burden on the employer to prove that an individual is not an employee um, using the IRS guidelines, which the IRS uses 20 factors to determine whether an individual is a, mis is a is an independent contractor. 
Um, there are statutory penalties and sanctions, particularly for construction contractors, because construction has been um, such a target for misclassification in recent years. Next slide, please. Again, um, this is this is not uh, this is this is in line with what's been going on around the country. Um, there's been a lot in particular going on recently in California. Um, California is the land of the ABC test, the most stringent test for worker classification. The ABC test stands for absence of control, business of the worker, and customarily engaged. And what it basically does is it uh, drills down into three factors for determining whether an individual is an independent contractor. And you have to meet all three in order to properly classify someone as a non-employee. And that's different from all of the traditional common law tests that we've always applied, the, the, the six factor test that uh, has always been applied by the Department of Labor, the 20 factor test applied by the IRS. You have all these factors that really boil down to how much control is being exerted over the worker um, and you know whether the individual is really in business for themselves. And you can kind of you know, use the totality of the circumstances. You could probably argue either way for many workers. This ABC test, you have to meet each aspect of the test in order to treat someone as an independent contractor. And the one that becomes very difficult for most companies to meet when it, when it comes to independent contractors is the fact that the worker has to perform work that is outside the usual course of the company's business. So, I mean, that's the hang up for so many is even if you have someone who's, you know, pretty independent, pretty in charge of their own work, they decide how much they work, they decide how much they make. If they're doing what your company does, then in California under the ABC test, it's a no-go. They're an employee. There are actually 33 states that currently impose tests that are similar to the ABC test. None are as stringent because um, that that aspect of having to meet all three factors is really what makes California so difficult. Um, but that concept of having to be engaged in work that is outside the course of the company's business is, uh, is what makes it so difficult to show that an indiv individual is, uh, is an independent contractor. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> on that note, uh, under, the, under the previous administration and the Trump administration, actually right at the final hour, they rolled out new DOL, a new DOL rule that actually loosened um, the independent, the traditional independent contractor analysis uh, that would be applied by the Department of Labor. As I mentioned before, the Department of Labor used to impose, it was a little bit more informal, um, but they imposed a six factor test, again, relating to the control exerted over the worker, um, opportunity for, for profit or loss and, and those factors that we're all likely familiar with. And this new rule attempted to simplify that um, and focus on two core factors, which would be the nature and degree of the control, and then the opportunity for profit or loss, and then only move on to any other factors if there was a, a disconnect between where you landed on both of those two factors. Next slide, please. Not surprisingly, everyone expected this to happen, but under the new administration, that rule was rescinded. Um, and the explanation being that, you know, that it, was, it, it would have loosened the test too much. And in fact, President Biden has indicated a preference for the ABC test, something similar to what we see in California. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the, uh, the new January 2020, 2021 rule was not uh, particularly in line with that policy objective. So uh, we could expect and, and will likely see more stringent federal misclassification tests being imposed by the Department of Labor under the current administration. All right, on to the fun stuff. So marijuana. So in uh, 2021, this year, uh, Virginia joined many other states um, in partially legalizing marijuana. Marijuana has been uh, legal for certain medicinal purposes in, since 2015 in Virginia, but what the uh, sort of hand in hand with the new law, there was a, there was a decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. Um, that being said, it's still not legal for most individuals to sell, or possess large amounts of marijuana. 
um, but recreational use has become decriminalized in the state. As part of these new laws, there was also um, a, a new mar marijuana law that provides additional protections for employees who do have uh, prescriptions uh, for medical marijuana or medical marijuana cards as it's called you know, colloquially. Employers are not allowed to discharge, discipline, discriminate, or, or take adverse action against an employee because of the fact that they have a prescription for medical marijuana or their lawful use of cannabis as prescribed consistent with Virginia law. Um, but an employee must have a medical marijuana card to be eligible for these protections. So true or false, an employer in Virginia may still terminate an employee due to testing positive for marijuana. Some, I saw someone clever wrote, it depends. <laughs> the lawyer answered. And that is of course uh, still true, but it does depend. There are caveats. Um, I'll give some time for everybody to finish weighing in. Okay, so none of the anti-retaliation provisions that we talked about protects employees who do not have a lawful prescription for medical marijuana in Virginia. And in fact, the medical marijuana law in Virginia is actually pretty limited. Um, how it's being used in practice, I don't know, but in terms of how it is codified, uh, you can have a prescription for cannabis oil in, in Virginia, and there's a very, you know, there are, there are authorized prescribers, and there's a particular uh, prescription form that's supposed to be used. So unless an, an individual falls into the category of those who possess that prescription, they are not protected by the anti-retaliation provisions of the Virginia statute. And then even for those that have a prescription for marijuana or for cannabis oil, um, the protections do not limit an employer from taking an adverse action in response to the employee being impaired and unable to perform their job while they're supposed to be working. Um, they don't prohibit employers from continuing to uh, prohibit their employees from having or using marijuana at work. Um, they also, there's also a carve out that an employer does not have to comply with the law if it would require them to commit any act that is in violation of federal law or that would cause the loss of a federal contract or federal funding, which even though it's somewhat inartful, at least what we've um, been interpreting that to carve out, you know, if you're a DOT employer and you have to impose drug tests because, uh, because of that or because, you're a, because of your federal contractor status, uh, the fact that you, you know, if you have an obligation under federal law or because of your relationship with the federal government or the federal agency that requires you to exclude those who have a positive test for marijuana, you know, you, you can comply with that, arguably under that carve out without running afoul of this Virginia law. Also under the law, an employee must disclose their medical marijuana authorization status and if an accommodation is needed. So if you've got a drug, a positive drug test, obviously they've got to let you know that they have this prescription in order for you to accommodate. Obviously, again, um, we're seeing this all over the place. Um, there have been 18 states to legalize small amounts of marijuana since 2012. Um, recent states just in the past couple of years include Connecticut, New York, New Mexico. We all know about Colorado. Um, but obviously the disconnect is it still remains a schedule one illegal drug on the federal side. Um, that has not been changed yet. So it puts employers in a difficult position sometimes when it comes to trying to strike a balance between it, a, a drug that's still the most illegal it can possibly be under federal law where while you can't discriminate against employees for using it in some, in some instances. Next slide, please. Actually, I will turn this over back to David to give you an update on COVID-19 in Virginia. Nobody wants to hear about COVID-19, I know that. And uh, you know, I, I sympathize with you all if you're dealing with this uh, more hours a day than you ever wanted to. Uh, as many of you who are in Virginia are aware, uh, last year, uh, the Virginia Department of Labor and Industry at the direction of uh, Governor Northam uh, has passed and created an emergency temporary standard and that standard uh, went into place last summer. 
uh, employers had to comply with it. Uh, it then became a permanent standard in January of this year, and there is a new permanent standard. Now, Virginia is one of the few states uh, that has issued these workplace regulations. Um, and the federal government has uh, noticed that. Uh, the federal OSHA has noticed that. And presumably, uh, very shortly, we are going to get um, a federal OSHA standard. And don't be surprised if there are some similarities between the Virginia standard and what OSHA puts out. Um, the permanent standard, one of the big changes in the most recent version of the permanent standards is the original permanent standard did not initially address vaccination status and what would occur uh, about people who were vaccinated versus non-vaccinated people. Um, this permanent standard uh, in kind of in lines with uh, Governor Northam's uh, executive order requiring masks only for unvaccinated individuals in, in many instances, uh, this permanent standard is to, has been adopted to address you know, when masks need to be worn in the workplace, who needs to wear them and where. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the key requirements in this permanent standard, uh, it imposes a set of rules instead of the old uh, process where you had low risk, moderate risk, high risk, uh, and different rules for those various categories. Uh, there is now one set of rules that applies to all employers, irregardless of what, you know, whether they are higher risk or lower risk. However, there are some additional standards for the healthcare industry and for workplaces that are defined as higher risk workplaces. Um, importantly, this regulation also says that if an employer is complying with current, and it's gotta be current, CDC guidance and recommendations, then they will be deemed to comply with the Virginia standard. Uh, originally, the language was going to say that it was only if the employer was uh, complying with a CDC standard that provided greater protections, but that language did not survive the final draft of the standard. So, you know, if you are dealing with some very difficult issues in your workplace under this DOLLY standard, you can always go to the CDC guidance and, and recommendations and see if there's a way for you to, to help your workplace out through the CDC standards. Um, you will have to have a COVID-19 policy in place that tracks the permanent standard. Uh, and so you need to if you're an employer in Virginia, you need to get those in place. Um, you're going to have to assess your workplace for hazards that could expose employees to COVID-19 and inform employees how they are to self-monitor for symptoms. Uh, under this standard, a lot of people have wondered, can you make an inquiry of employees about whether they are vaccinated or not? And I think you've seen in the last month, Almost every federal agency and state agency to address that issue has come down all square saying, yes, you can ask that question. Yes, you can ask for proof of vaccination status. You're gonna to have to keep that information when you gather it uh, separate and apart from other employee, the, that individual's employment records, but you can make those inquiries. Um, employers, have to require masking and distancing for unvaccinated employees under this DOLLY standard. So do that. Um, to the extent that you have people who are known or suspected to have case, COVID cases, you need to get them out of the workplace. Then they have to go through testing and return to work protocols. Uh, the emergency standard also imposes cleaning and sanitation requirements and as I mentioned earlier, reiterates the confidentiality of medical information. 
and it has a prohibition just like the other did against retaliation. Next slide, please. All right. OSHA issued a emergency temporary standard for healthcare workers in June of 2021. And as we know from President Biden's uh, presentation last month, there is a federal OSHA standard coming that will apply to any employer who has 100 or more employees. If they do have those 100 or more employees, then they will need to mandate vaccination. And for those who get an exemption, from the mandation either for a religious accommodation or a disability accommodation, there will have to be weekly testing. Uh, you know, this is gonna remain a hot button topic, no question. Uh, we're all gonna continue to grapple with it. And I think we can all assume that the standards will be in flux and change from time to time. And we just have to be prepared for that and work with that uh, process and make sure that you are keeping up to date with where these standards are, especially if you're going to rely in Virginia on CDC standards as opposed to poten potentially trying to comply with every single piece of the, of the DOLLY standards. So you're gonna have to keep up to date with the CDC standards. All right, well, it is 1150 and it is now time for us to uh, deal with questions that uh, you may have. So if we take a look at the q and I know I saw some coming in as we, as we went through. Uh, to the extent we do not get through that, um, uh, to the extent we do not get through all of these questions, we will um, answer, we'll follow up in an email with you all. All right. So a, a Tom Barnum has asked, can you clarify whether the Virginia Overtime Wages Act requires overtime paid to salaried employees that would be different from the FLSA if o overtime is required for salaried exempt personnel? Could you give some examples? Okay, great question. Uh, Amanda, I'll take this one and then I'll let you, uh, let you do the, uh, the, uh, the next question. Um, so, if a person is truly a salaried exempt employee under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, then that individual, uh, you will still not be required to pay them overtime. Uh, as long as they meet the salary basis test, uh, they're paid the appropriate salary level, and they have one of the exempt duties, be it an executive, an administrative, or a professional exemption, or outside sales. So you, you, know, you can look at those issues. There's also the computer personnel uh, exemption. So if you truly have somebody who is exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you will still be able to um, have those uh, exemptions. What the change is, is in Virginia is if I have a non-exempt employee who I have paid on a salary basis, that's that's permissible under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, and if I have that type of situation, I was able in most uh, instances under federal law to apply the fluctuating workweek method of overtime uh, payments to that individual if they work more than 40 hours a week. And that really meant that instead of paying them time and a half, because they were already being paid a salary, I only had to pay them half time for the hours they worked over 40 in a work week. Uh, under the new Virginia statute, I'm not gonna be able to do that in Virginia. So if you are a Virginia employer and you are using the fluctuating work week method of overtime compensation for your salaried non-exempt employees, you need to change that. All right, next question. So David, to piggyback on that, we got a we got a more we we got multiple questions regarding um, paying whether salaried employees are entitled to overtime now in Virginia, and also um, a request to to recap the distinction between who's exempt and who's non-exempt. Um, I wish we had time for that. That would be its own presentation. Um, but I do think the underlying issue and that David just touched on is many employers continue to 
to operate under the misconception that if an employee is paid a salary, they are exempt. That is not true. Uh, most of the exemptions require an employee to be paid on a salary basis, not all of them, but most, but that's only one prong of how an in individual is properly exempt. So in order to making sure, in, in addition to making sure that your employees that you're treating as exempt are properly exempt, uh, you need to look at both whether they're getting paid correctly, whether they're getting paid a salary of at least the, the minimum, the federal minimum, but also that they are, um, as David mentioned, uh, meet, they, they, that they fall into one of the enumerated exemptions. It has to do with the duties that are being performed. Um, and they are typically a somewhat high bar. So in, in general, employers need to, this is a good time for employers to revisit their exemption classifications, make sure that they're comfortable with them um, because of the fact that there are now more stringent overtime requirements um, in Virginia for those salaried employees. All right, we have another question. Um, this is going to the misclassification uh, statutes and changes that are out there. Uh, proving intent by the employer to misclassify an individual would seem to be a high bar. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that it's going to be the case. Uh, when you look at this Virginia statute, when you look at some of the changes that we're seeing under federal law, and also there is out in Congress right now, the protecting the right to organize statute. Uh, that is an amendment to the National Labor Relations Act. If it were to be passed, uh, that statute, like we're going to see in a lot of other uh, situations, that statute says that anyone who performs work for an employer will be deemed to be an employee and not an independent contractor, unless again, the burden goes to the employer to show that they have properly classified the individual as an independent contractor. So the presumption is going to be uh, in most of these situations, the employer, if they have an independent contractor, it's gonna be prove it. Uh, and if you can't prove it, you will be deemed to have had the intent to misclassify. And intent is really not even, I mean, it's never been an aspect of, um, the of misclassification. I mean, if you've intentionally misclassified, then you probably are going to find yourself in a universe with higher penalties. Um, but even if you had no idea uh, what you had, that the arrangement that you had entered was misclassification, um, if it was, and, and still if it is, uh, then there's going to be exposure. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions as well about medical marijuana in Virginia. Um, and I will sort of combine a couple that I've seen because it seems to the gist of the question is, um, have we started to see or are we going to see requests for um, accommodating the use of marijuana at work in Virginia? And I think it's worth reiterating under federal law, um, it, it's you can still prohibit the use of marijuana at work, outside of work, federal law, you can still terminate for a, a, a positive drug test for marijuana. In Virginia, all that has changed is the inability to sort of summarily terminate or exclude somebody because they lawfully use prescribed marijuana outside of work or they test positive for marijuana, you know, simply because they have a prescription. It is, there is still no obligation for employers in Virginia to accommodate or to allow individuals to use marijuana at work. I mean, I, I typically analogize to alcohol. I mean, alcohol is legal. People aren't getting terminated for drinking alcohol outside of work. Um, but that doesn't mean that people can show up drunk. Um, a not so hypothetical example that just came up for, uh, for somebody that I was helping was they had an employee who was uh, discovered smoking weed in his car in the parking lot on a break. And they were concerned because he said, well, I have a prescription. And for now in Virginia, that doesn't matter. I mean, you, if, as long as the company has, the employer has a consistent policy of not allowing you to use the drug at work, um, then you, you're not required to allow that. that. That individual can be terminated for that if it's consistent with policy. 
Now, again, I would imagine at least under Virginia law, there could certainly be discretion um, if you if you wanted to allow somebody to use uh, mar prescribed marijuana while they are at work. Um, but I would be cautious about that because it would certainly limit your ability to take a different stance um, down the road. Um, but, it, you know, you're not required to terminate someone for doing it, but you're also not required to accommodate it on the job. David, right, well, any it looks like we've got time for one more question. Uh, there's a question here. Would you please expand upon the prohibition against retaliation related to COVID-19? What about mandatory vaccines? Is termination for failing to be vaccinated or obtain an exemption considered retaliation? Uh, great question again. Uh, under the Dolly standard and what I presume we will see with some of these with the federal OSHA standard and even under, you know, Title VII and American with Disabilities Act, uh, if an employee uh, says that, you know, the employer implements a vaccination policy and says employees will be vaccinated and an individual says, I don't need a reasonable accommodation for a disability or uh, for religion, but I don't believe the government should be able to tell me whether or not I want to take a vaccination. This is a political issue for me, and therefore I'm not going to have the vaccination. Uh, an employer, if their policy was you will get the vac vaccination absent an accommodation, uh, the employer could terminate uh, in that circumstance and not violate uh, the anti-retaliation provisions of the Virginia Dolly Standard and presumably what will be anti-retaliation provisions in the federal Dolly standard. All right. One more quick clarification. We've got a couple of questions because we goofed and somehow deleted or didn't include a bullet point on um, the US trends, non-compete laws, the quote unquote most sweeping law, the one we were talking about that was recently enacted is from DC. So that was in DC, it's been enacted, it hasn't taken effect, but that's the one that prohibits non-competes after employment and also moonlighting policies as of now while you're employed. So keep an eye on that one. All right, well, we are at our close. Uh, if you did submit a question and we could not answer it, we will do so in writing. We thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us. You get a lunch break now. And after the lunch break, you will hear from Paul Saunders and Charles Kemp who will discuss everyday ethics for in-house counsel, and that will start at 1230. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.